So at this time, I would like to just pass the mic over to um, Jonathan uh, McCoy, where he's going to talk, he's going to introduce himself and talk a little bit about the historical perspective of Juneteenth. Uh, and then he will pass it over to Dr. Orlene Simmons, uh, president and founder of the MLK Association, who will talk a little bit about the Juneteenth celebration throughout the history of Asheville. And then, time permitted, we will open it up for um, any questions and answers. So again, on behalf of the MLK Association of Asheville and Buncombe County and the city of Asheville, welcome to the Juneteenth 2023 celebrations. Well, um, thank you, Dr. Fox. And good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Jonathan McCoy. I'm a professor of history at Mars Hill University. I'm also director of Mars Hill University Center for um, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and a Mars Hill graduate just like um, Dr. Simmons. I'm class of 92. Um, also part of the um, MLK Association's board of directors, I'm vice president. And um, as Dr. Fox said, I was asked to really talk about the history of Juneteenth. And when you talk about Juneteenth, you have to understand it's more than just a day. Juneteenth is really a look at American history, and it helps put into perspective um, the African American experience in, in America. And the struggle that went on for Juneteenth to happen, but the struggle that continued on after Juneteenth happened. And so one thing that has gone on in recent years is that Juneteenth has become more of a recognized um, um, spot in America's psyche, in America's viewpoint, especially since 2020. More Americans are aware that Juneteenth is, is a, a thing, is an event. Um, but understand that in the African American community, it's always been there. Though it happened in Texas, as those former enslaved people left Texas, the story of Juneteenth left with them. And so it became part of the African American community. Now, some places it was strong, and some places it was strong and kind of ebbed away, but the main thing is that it has come back, but it's come back also with a psyche and an awareness that's going across all of society, reaching out from Af the African American community. But when you look at Juneteenth, the first thing everybody talks about is, okay, Juneteenth happens in 1865, but it's a reminder that there's an Emancipation Proclamation that happens in 1863. But even before then, you have a July 4th of 1776. So first of all, you have that July 4th, Independence Day, where you have this Declaration of Independence and this embracement of freedom, but there's an understanding that it was not freedom for everybody that was in the United States, namely those that were enslaved, namely black people. And we know from 1776 moving on that that goes on. Even when the new constitution is ratified in 1789, we know that there's at least three places in that constitution that is embedded that slavery will remain. One part is that they will not even consider ending the importation of Africans until 1808. It's right there, one of the first things that's in the Constitution, that Congress came and start debating it until 1808 to end the importation. Now, that, that happens, but then you have the internal slave trade. All right, we know about the Three-Fifths Compromise. Also, there is a um, fugitive slave clause that's in there. So we know that slavery was part of the founding of America but it goes on. So we know that slavery is happening. 1863, we have the Emancipation Proclamation. It happens on January, it comes into effect January 1st of 1863. And it tells um, this declaration by Lincoln that enslaved people um, are free, but also recognize that it only pertained to those that were in rebellion, those um, states that were part of the Confederacy. So in reality, it is the, um, Emancipation Proclamation didn't have any teeth to it because those people already had succeeded from the Union, so they weren't going to listen to Lincoln to free their slaves. And so 
that was one thing that as the war continued and as the Union starts going through um, the South and taking um, land and territory, one thing that the Army had to do was declare that proclamation, inform those former enslaved people that they are free. And so that happens in 1863. Well, we know that the war ends in 1865. Okay. As the war ends, it comes to that end in April. Well, one thing that happened also in um, the end of January of 1865 is that Congress passes the 13th Amendment ending slavery in America. Now, it's an amendment that means that three-fourths of the states have to ratify, they have to agree to it, and that starts going out for states to start voting on it. But we know 1863, you have the Emancipation Proclamation, so there's a movement to end slavery in the South. You have in 1865, right there at the end of January, beginning of February, the 13th Amendment passed to end slavery. So there's a movement, there's an awareness that slavery is ending in America. So how can we get to June 19th of 1865, and all of a sudden you have in Texas that enslaved people were not informed, they were free. Two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, months after the 13th Amendment had been passed and starting to be ratified, months after Lee surrenders at Appomattox, it doesn't happen because there wasn't a strong union presence in Texas until that June. All of a sudden you have in June 19th of 1865, you have the Union appear. Soldiers come under the command of General Gordon Granger and June 19th, Juneteenth is a reminder of what Granger reads. There's an announcement known as General Order Number Three and it happens in Galveston, Galveston, Texas. And General Order Number Three reads, the people are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And the connection here for existing between them become that between employer and hired labor. The freed are advised to remain at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect that military post and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. So they're informed that they're free. Those that are enslaved are now informed on that Juneteenth goes out. Two main things if you read writings or memories of those enslaved people as they get this freedom, one thing that they know is stressed by the union, don't work for free. Get paid, it says there in the, in the announcement. You are now entitled to pay. Now, it doesn't say how much you're supposed to be paid, so, you know, again, you can be paid 50 cents, hey, you're paid, you might be working work that's worth like five dollars, but you get 50 cents, but they were paid. Also, they were supposed to stay where they're at. So they were supposed to stay in place of the places where they had had a lifetime of trauma. Stay in place at those plantations where they had been enslaved, but now they were supposed to be treated as free people. Well, a couple of things happened. A lot of the former enslavers were slow to tell them even of General Order Number Three. You could read accounts that those people enslaved in Texas were still hard pressed to find out they were free until after the harvest time. Enslavers wanted to get that last bit of free, easy labor. And so it's June, remember harvest, most harvests don't happen until the fall. So some people were still, though they were told June 19th, some people still didn't get their freedom until October. Also the other point in the order was that they were supposed to remain on the plantation. Well, the, the former enslavers found that was hard to do. There was what is known right after Juneteenth as the scatter. People said, okay, we're free, I'm getting out of here. And they ran for it. They left the plantation. Some went further into Texas looking for um, jobs. A lot of them started to go up north looking for jobs, but also most of them started to go and try to find their loved ones, ones that had been sold away 
to other plantations. And you find that throughout the end of the Civil War, not only in Texas, but throughout even North Carolina. You can see, if you read newspapers at that time, also there are all these advertisements of, I'm looking for my son, I'm looking for my wife, I'm looking for my husband. He goes by his name of Jim, John, Sally. Last time I saw them, they were wearing a plaid shirt. I know they got sold to a plantation down by Greenville, South Carolina to a man named Johnson. Has anybody seen them? You see those advertisements going out. So the scatter was also trying to find a way to reconnect with family that had been lost, that had been sold away. And so you have all that happening. So you have this arc of, yes, Jane, July 4th of independence, but we know it was an independence of freedom for everyone, especially enslaved people. We have that arc of the Emancipation Proclamation happens on um, January 1st of 1863. Again, not for everyone. Finally, you have the Union soldiers show up in Galveston, Texas on June 19th, 1865, in the announcement that there's freedom. And that's still slow to happen. And as I leave, and we'll hopefully have time for questions as I finish this up, the one thing that you have to remember why Juneteenth was also one of those things that a lot of people didn't know about, because when you think about it, what holiday do we ever celebrate the Civil War and the end of the Civil War? We read about it, we learn about it in books, but we don't have anything that marks as a celebration. Now, being in the South, we have Confederate Day. I remember growing up, they used to have, get time off for Lee's birthday. But we never had a thing of, here's the end of the Civil War, the freedom of enslaved people. Juneteenth has become that holiday now since it was passed in 2021 and 2022, and now in 2023, it's trying to be this recognized thing. But one reason that it's quiet is we haven't had that holiday. And also, there is some of that gaslighting that goes on. Because what we come to believe is that, OK, Lee surrendered. The war was over. The slaves were free. But we know the arc that no, that freedom was still slow to come by. And for some people, daily to come by. And even as that freedom happened, we know that there's a backlash because if everybody was so free, how did we end up with Jim Crow for another 100 years? And even after Jim Crow ends, why is there still resistance even today of trying to learn that history? And so what Juneteenth is really a reminder of is that we have a ways to go as a nation, but the only way we can get there is by acknowledging where we've come from and the pain that has taken us to get here. Acknowledge that and learn from that and grow. So that's somewhat of the history and progression of Juneteenth. But now I will hand it over to Dr. Simmons, who will take a little look at Asheville. Thank you very much. And good day uh, to you, everyone. I am Dr. Orlene Simmons, president and founder of the Dr. Martin Luther King Association of Asheville and Buncombe County. There is an excitement in the air. Juneteenth holiday is almost here. It has been called Day of Jubilee, Freedom Day, Emancipation Day, all are African American Independence Day. Some people here in our city have never heard of Juneteenth. But I am glad that they finally got the word that Juneteenth is now a national holiday. An Independence Day which celebrates the end of slavery in the United States of America. Public awareness of Juneteenth grew in the 2020s amid nationwide protests after the violent police killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And President Biden signed the legislation that made Juneteenth a federal holiday in 2020. Now, 
How long has Juneteenth been celebrated locally in our community? It was many, many, many years ago. Families, organizations, and churches celebrated with a jubilee and sometimes the old time camp meeting. It could be a celebration telling the history of Juneteenth with African-American gospel music and spiritual hymns of freedom that expressed the sorrow, joy, and aspirations of black people. You could hear songs such as Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Coming Forth to Carry Me Home, Kumbaya, Oh Freedom, Oh Freedom Over Me, before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go to my Lord and be free. That was a gospel trained with, she's coming, get on board, there is room for many more, and I am free. Or just a few other songs to mention. And of course, the Negro National Anthem lift every voice and sing. The last verse, sometimes used as a prayer. It reads, and if you would like, please remain seated. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us far on the way, Thou who has by the might led us into the light. Keep us forever in the path, we pray. Lest our feet stray from this place, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadows beneath thy hand, may we forever stand. True to our God, true to our native land. There was poetry written by black poets that could have been won by Langston Hughes entitled Democracy that reads, Democracy will not come today, this year, not ever through compromise and fear. I have as much right as the other fella has to stand on my own two feet and own the land. I tire so much of hearing people say, let things take their course. Tomorrow is another day. I do not need my freedom when I'm dead. I cannot live on tomorrow's bread. Freedom is a strong seed planted in a good need. I live here too. I want freedom just like you. There were games and stories for children and good food for everyone and, of course, blessed by the preacher. It was Sophie Dixon that told me in the 1980s about Day of Jubilee, a public celebration of Juneteenth in our community sponsored by the Black Fraternal of Elks. The organization was formed in 1864. The late John Hayes at Radio WRES encouraged his listening audience to participate in Juneteenth by coming aware of his history and taking action. Another noted public Juneteenth observance was celebrated at Ashton Park in the 1990s with educational programs, music, and poetry. The Center for Diversity at UNCA joined in the local commemoration of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, and this was in 2008 with the showing of the exhibit entitled Lincoln and the Constitution at Pack Library. And again in 2013, celebrating the 150th anniversary they worked with Buncombe County Register of Deeds to create an online exhibit, Forever Free, which is now part of the special collections at the library. 
more widespread events were held with the festival sponsored by Abipa on Father's Day. There were forums and other events honoring the day. Andrea Clark, local photojournalist, created the James Vester Miller Walking Trail, kicked it off on Juneteenth. We're now in the 2020s. Now and people are looking forward to other activities that they can participate in. You can find diverse celebrations that foster community participation. Aisha Adams commented that, <clears throat> we love that Asheville is filled with so many allies for freedom. For Juneteenth, we are lifting up communities organizations, and people who are tracking complex social issues like cultivating safe spaces for diversity, equality, and inclusivity. Festivals were held at Hillcrest Apartment Park, followed by one at Martin Luther King Jr. Park, and last year at Pack Square Park with local arts performers and live bands. The Asheville City Council, as well as the Buncombe County Commission, designated Juneteenth as a city and county holiday. Vance Birthplace presented activities and other events were held across Buncombe County. An array of activities has been planned for Juneteenth, 2023, across our community, including one produced by the Martin Luther King Association of Asheville and Buncombe County, in partnership with the city of Asheville, which includes a number of activities, and Dr. Joseph Fox has that information for you. This brings us to Erica, a rate of change of attitudes is spelled E-R-C-A. For Juneteenth, the E stands for education. And Dr. Jonathan McCoy presented that today. Information on the history of Juneteenth the aura is for reflect as we continue to pause and consider how far we have come since slavery. The C is for commemorate and the A is for act. Action, not just for a day, but always. How do we take action on? Where do we go from here? Before we open it up for questions, I do want to um, recognize our sponsors, and that's why we're able to do all five lunch and learn for free. So of course we want to thank the city of Asheville, Buncombe County, AB Tech, Asheville City Schools Foundations, Mission Health, Juneteenth of Asheville, Vario Beer, Arts Asheville, and Explore Asheville. I don't think I left anybody out. Um, so what we're going to ask folks to do, since we're recording this, if you have a question for our panelists, to kind of come to the front and uh, speak in your outdoor voice uh, so that we can pick it up, we're going to ask our uh, panelists to kind of repeat the question uh, before answering. And I guess that means we'll open it up. Does anybody have a question of, about Juneteenth or the anything, I guess, kind of pertaining, pertaining to even just that history in general. 
Hey y'all, uh, my name's Drew Ball. I live over on the other side of Sweet Creek. Uh, thank you for your remarks today. Um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about the more um, recent push to recognize Juneteenth that has led to the federal recognition um, in recent years and kind of maybe some of the social movements that have happened recently or maybe kind of behind the scenes organizations, what was happening on Capitol Hill to finally recognize this as a federal holiday. Well, it's been stated there's always been there's always been a a push and it seems like for so many um uh black people they were so much connected into the church which was a part of their uh community and a place where so many um meetings were held and they talked about in talking about um uh freedom and talking about a big push uh, for this to become a, a holiday. And I think I mentioned, and I want to repeat that here, was it was at the beginning. Um, In, the, in 1920, amid nationwide protests after the violent police killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and President Biden signed the legislation that made Juneteenth a federal holiday in 2020. Just to mention one. And I think what also was going on was that, as I said, that racial reckoning, as we say that time period from 2020 even now, but also recognition that as we were reckoning, we've also have had a, especially as we've seen in 2022 and 2023, a racial backlash to that reckoning. And I think that um, what was going on was at that time, there was this push, oh, we're going to learn. And so there was movement um, to, to pass that legislation. Um, Texas started, um, have recognized Juneteenth as a state holiday in 1980. It was first introduced into um, Congress in 1997, um, I believe. And from 97 on, every year, one house or the other, the, either the representatives or the Senate, have introduced the legislation for it to be passed and there was no momentum. It was always getting stopped. And so then when 2020 happened and it was this protest of, you know, we've said we've come so far, but we're seeing that we haven't, there was that momentum. And you see that also in the symbolism of Juneteenth. There is a Juneteenth flag. And, um, and you can go some places and you'll see it um, that is up. Um, the flag, it has a big white star on it to represent um, Texas, the Lone Star State, but also represents the 50 states and that freedom for enslaved people is across this whole nation. Um, around that star is basically a burst, is an outline, um, which represents, again, a new beginning that Juneteenth was supposed to bring for African Americans in this um, nation. There's a curve that's on the flag um, that is a reminder that enslaved people and their descendants are Americans, that arc that still goes on. And it's red and white and blue to represent, again, America. Now, since 2020, as this has become a national holiday, there has been also, you can see, a, each community has kind of personalized that flag. You might not see that flag as much. You might see more colors of the black and red and gold of the Pan-African movement, which is a connection, again, that comes from that 2020, that though there was this freedom of Juneteenth, the struggle didn't end. It became, in some ways, more entrenched. That there's red on that flag, yes, it's part of the colors of America, but red for also all the blood that has been spilt from enslavement even through this time, through Jim Crow, even modern day, be it um, killings by law enforcement or somewhere else like that. But there's also, you might see green for resilience, evergreen, that through all this, again, a nation that seems to be against black people, black people still are here 
haven't gone anywhere, still thriving against all odds, still trying to thrive. And so that's also part of that from 2020 on, this movement that, hey, Juneteenth is an expression that we're, we're not going anywhere. This is our country, like I said again, this recognition that we've been fighting for this nation since its birth. And we are part, and people might want to deny it, Juneteenth is a recognition that this is here. And so that's what I think helped push that national movement for it to become a, a national holiday. Juneteenth is the first holiday, federal holiday since another African-American holiday, Dr. Martin Luther King Day. So the last two federal holidays have dealt and been centered in the African-American community, but they're still few and far between when you look at the impact and the influence the African-American community has in our society. But I think that's the movement that you see and why it came about. Hi, my name is Lady Montgomery. Um, thank you for bringing that analogy. I haven't heard the ERCA, the education, the reflection, commemoration, and action. So one thing that's really important to me is the action piece. And where do we go from here is a question that you all asked. And so there's some key words that I heard you all say, um, recognition, acknowledgement, resilience of black people. Um, do you feel we can leverage Juneteenth to support the reparations movement that is occurring nationwide and here in Asheville? And if so, what would be your suggestions and where do we start? I think the, the, it, it, it centers on education. The reparations, again, first of all, there's power in words. Just like we, we know that words will be co-opt, okay? We, if you study, we know the history of the word woke in the African-American community. Led Bay does a song talking about the Scottsboro boys who are wrongly arrested and jailed because it's assumed they've done something, um, basically um, assault on a white woman. And so the whole thing of woke is being, reminding black people as you travel through the South that you better stay awake to the threat that you live in. I mean, that was the whole thing about the Green Book. Again, where can you, where can you stay, where can you go? So as I get to reparations, you get, again, that co-opting of words. A lot of times, again, there's this belief that, okay, you know, black community is looking for free money. No, we're looking for a way that you will um, reverse the policies of um, basically redlining. You know, when you have communities that people get pushed into and not allowed to um, buy into different policies by banks that don't give loans. Again, the whole idea goes into, first of all, education, educating people about this history and starting to be able to move the needle that there will be legislation, which means that then you will have government backing to enforce change. If you're gonna have in the redlining, that means you have to have laws that are written down that are gonna be enforced that's gonna make sure that people follow it. They're not just talking about it. So again, it has to be education. And that's why I say Juneteenth is one of those big gaslighting things because again, people wanna say, oh, well, slavery just ended. Well, no, slavery, why did they deny the freedom to the slaves. They knew slavery was ending in the nation, they denied it, they gaslit. And we see that today, and what it goes with education, that's why you have things like book banning, that's why you have trying to take out um, sections of um, textbooks, that's why all of a sudden, they're, they're, if this idea that we're not united, if they can overturn Roe v. Wade, what's to say they can't overturn Brown versus Board? They're both presidents. You know, that's, so if they can do one, what do you do? If they can write laws to start to limit accessibility for people in the queer community, why can't they do the same to people in the African American community? So the education has to be the how this unity of equality happens. And so when you start looking at the power of the words, it comes back to the education of what is the, Heart of the word, what does it really mean? And when people understand that, then they can start fighting, they can start actually voting and showing up at um, committee in um, community commission meetings and saying, hey, wait a minute, this is the way we want our community to go. And know that they're saying it from a place of informed 
knowledge and not just emotional knowledge, but it has to be a thing that gets embedded. So I think education is the way to help um, start pushing, you know, intentional action. I, I hope that answers your, your question. This education that you're speaking of, can, can it happen in our local school systems? And if so, is there information given by, say, your, your association for teachers to use? I think there's something that we are um, being faced with today, as um, Jonathan mentioned about um, banning the books. Uh, do we teach black history in school? Uh, is it uh, too emotional for some students, and particularly white students, to learn about slavery? Uh, we're being we're being faced with that question today, and I hope that more and more people will start to speak out on a program that we can teach children in the schools. It's um, it's possible that uh, the Martin Luther King Association can design some kind of program uh, for schools if they would be be open and acceptable to that. I do remember when we first started celebrating Martin Luther King's birthday here, the schools were eager to invite us in to talk about uh, Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. Um, we do not receive that many invitations now because um, the schools are now uh, imparting that inf some of that information to the to the children. Even though we do a scholarship program uh, and we give scholarships to outstanding uh, high school seniors to further their their education, and one of the things that's required is that they have to do uh, an essay. Uh, and that always um, pertains to Martin Luther King and his work. Um, we, as an association, will continue to find more ways and avenues to to spread our um, our education, and hopefully that will be in the school system. And I, I think also one thing that, that we have learned coming as we work through COVID, that there are more um, resources that are available online. A lot of, them, a lot of schools are starting to really, especially in um, higher ed, about um, open, open resources, resources that are free. So I think one thing that um, we as association can help is creating a, a, a database. You know, here, here are, here are um, lessons, writings, books that are available online that deal with these subjects. Um, in, in reality, can it, can it happen? Can change, you know, can change really happen? Yes. I, I, I say this, I guess I'm, I'm optimistic and I'm a pessimist. So I, I say this in reality, this is what I, I say um, all the time and, I, and so I stand by it. Change will happen when more people feel the pain. And when I see, say the pain, the realization of how dangerous ignorance is. It's what people in Utah are learning right now. They now I'm banning the books and now they're mad if you go read, they're mad because now the Bible's been banned in schools. Because somebody said, well, when you read the Bible, it has all these objective things, and so they banned it. So now they're like, wait a minute, we didn't want that banned, we wanted all those other books banned. It's like, oh, well, is what they're realizing in Florida. They passed an anti-immigration law. And so now all the people that have been working in construction and in hotels and everything else, all of a sudden, you just saw the past two weeks, um, Republican lawmakers down in Florida are trying to meet with people um, that are part of immigration groups and trying to get them to go out and convince um, um, people that might be there illegally or be trying to immigrate. Don't leave Florida 
because now they need them to work because all of a sudden all those jobs, all those things, all that money is being lost, all they're starting to feel the pain. So now it's like, oh, wait a minute, we're all in this together. And that's what's going to bring the change. You can go and you can fuss and yell at the school board and we want to do all this, but all of a sudden when you start to realize that, wait a minute, this is affecting my child too, and now I'm cutting off my nose to spite my face, now wait a minute, I might be more open to change. And that's really when you go back to that um, Montgomery bus boycott. They didn't want black folks, they didn't care about them not riding a bus until they weren't riding a bus downtown and spending money. They tried to find all these different ways to force them to get on the bus so they can make money. The bus company started losing money, downtown business started losing money, and what after about a year what happened was, hey, let's come to the table and find an agreement. They start feeling the pain. And unfortunately for humans and unfortunately for our nation, when more people feel the pain, when they finally realize that those them that you're pointing out, you know, like we used to say, you got, you point one thing, you got three pointing back at yourself, so all those thems you're going after, you're really talking about yourself, when everybody starts to feel it, then the change happens because then they realize we're all on the same boat and we need one another instead of trying to cut each other out. So I do think it'll happen, but unfortunately I think it's going to be um, a little more pain before it does. Let's give our